Thank you so much for the nice introduction. And thank you all for coming. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm hoping to keep this pretty informal. So if you have questions, definitely feel free to interrupt me, raise your hand, uh, and we'll just um, take it as we go. So as Michael said, um, I was a graduate student at the University of Washington before um, I joined Adobe. And there I was actually started out as a computer graphics researcher. And I did work in animation and image compositing. And then I came over to the to the good side and started doing HCI and, and finished uh, my thesis in, in HCI, as, as Michael just described. And when it was time to graduate, I was really excited to look at Adobe and to go to Adobe. And that's because they make software that's really near and dear to my heart. How many of you have, um, have heard of, of Photoshop? Almost all of you. Now, how many of you have used Photoshop? OK, good. Now, how many of you are using it 15 years ago? Uh, wow, I might be the only one in this room. It's, it's never happened to me that, that I'm the only one. But, but trust me, I was using it 15 years ago. And here, um, here's my classroom. I was, I was in high school at the time. And I was really, really into photography. And when I discovered Photoshop, I was in heaven. All of a sudden, I could make art. I could take the analog pictures that I was producing and combine them in all cool and different ways. And this is, remember, before the age of the digital camera. Um, but let's fast forward 15 years. So what happens today? Well, I still take lots and lots of pictures, but I'm not an artist. Um, that's what I was aspiring to be back then. Um, what I do now in Photoshop is very different. I tend to go in and I only have a few minutes, not hours. And I just want to make my pictures look good. I don't want to make artistic compositions. And in fact, when we look at our user base, or look at Photoshop's user base, the majority of people who use the software are like me. And that's despite the fact that the software was designed for professionals, for artists, and for photographers. And many of them struggle with the software the same way I do. Um, and the, um, the, 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 the software is incredibly rich. There's many, many options. But it can be very difficult to walk up to it and just get going. And today, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about Photoshop, mainly because that's where uh, we've been doing our experiments. But what I'm going to tell you about is not unique to Photoshop. Adobe makes a number of other software um, that has the same problems. And I would argue, in fact, many of our desktop softwares have this challenge. If you've ever tried to write a paper um, in Word or do your taxes in Excel, you've probably struggled just the same way that um, you would have struggled with, with Photoshop. Um, so here is a, a sense for what the talk will look like today. First, we'll look at what actually happens when people try to use visual design software like Photoshop. Where do they go when they struggle? And then we'll look at some of the research projects that we've been building to try and make this easier. So um, along with my colleagues at Adobe, we looked at what happens. What do people do when they encounter a task they don't know how to do in a software like Photoshop? And in particular, we had three research questions. First, how do people approach looking for help? Where do they go? Do they ask a friend? Do they open the browser? Do they go to a search engine, or do they come to Adobe's website trying to find um, the right answer. Second, what types of content are most useful? And this, this question um, is because we've looked at video and text and tried to understand what's useful about these different kinds of formats. And we found that you know, video, there's tons of video out there. It's easy to produce, but it can be hard to figure out whether this is a good video. Um, in contrast, text is easy to scan, but maybe it doesn't include all the details. And so we were really curious to see which form um, which instructional content format is preferred. And then finally, there are lots and lots of examples out there of how to do things in software like Photoshop. But are people able to take these examples and translate them to their own task? Invariably, the examples out there are not exactly the same as what the user is trying to accomplish. How easy is it for them to generalize those examples and follow on with them in their own context? So to answer these questions, we brought some people into the lab. We asked them to do some tasks. And we watched them. And we asked them questions. Um, they did one task that they knew how to do, and then uh, one or two more that they were unfamiliar with. And here we used the Photoshop 3D tools. 
You may not know this, but Photoshop has 3D tools uh, inside of it, and so you can manipulate um, 3D objects. So <clears throat> what happened? Well, what we found was that when we asked people where they go to help for help, they invariably tell us that they go to the, to the web for help. And this, I mean, this is, in this day and age, uh, really not that surprising. But really, what we're finding is that people are learning opportunistically. They're opening pieces of software and assuming that they will figure out how to use them. And when they can't figure out how to use them, they go to the web for help. So what happened in our actual study? Well, when given the task, in this case, take this can and put it on that table, what people did is they started tinkering. They would try to touch different menus and try to find the right tools and tinker their way to the solution. Some people were successful, but most were not. And so when they, when they had a hard time, they would go to their favorite search engine, they would query, look at various options, go back, refine their query, keep looking. When they found a document that seemed appropriate, they would keep it up open side by side and they would bounce back and forth between the application and that um, document, um, trying to follow the instructions. If they were successful, they declared success. And if not, they would go back to tinkering and hoping that now that they've read a little bit, maybe they could tinker in a more effective way. So um, um, search was, was, so back to our research question, how do people approach looking for help? Search was, was by far the, the thing that everyone did. They searched different places. So not everybody went to a Google or Bing. They, they would go to YouTube or they'd go to Adobe's website. Um, but invariably, everybody would search and they would um, issue and refine their queries. If we look at the kinds of queries people made, um, you'll find a few interesting things. Um, first off, the queries tend to be on the longer side, but that's probably because they include the software and version number in their queries. But more interestingly, if we compare the kinds of queries professionals make to those that, the, that novices make, you'll see um, a fairly um, interesting difference. When, we, when people tried to take that can and put it on that table, they had to resize it. They had to make it smaller. Um, a professional knows that to make that can smaller involves the scaling or transformation tool. A novice, on the other hand, doesn't know that language. So what this novice tried to do was shrink that can, reduce the size of that can, and that's not the language that Photoshop understands. And so when they went and queried Google using these keywords, they had a hard time finding the right, um, the right documents. Another interesting thing came about in our third task where we asked people to put text on a 3D object. So if you don't know how to do this, you probably go to, to a search engine and type add text to a 3D object or add type to a 3D object. What you'll discover if you do that is that the first, the top results for that query show you how to make text look 3D. And why is that? Well, that's just a more popular query. That's just a more popular task to do in Photoshop. Not a lot of people use the 3D tools, and so tutorials that have to do with the 3D tools don't show up um, up at the top. So what this really speaks to is that text is not really an insufficient way to query for help when you're struggling with a visual design um, application. What you'd really like to be able to do is actually point to things in that app or point to objects that you're working with. What if I could say, I want to make the size of this object smaller, or I'd like to you know, why is this menu item disabled? What if a search engine could take it as input not just text, but other kinds of objects? Yes? Okay. Wouldn't that suffer from the same vocabulary problem where I would point at the screen and I'd say, I really want to shrink this. It says, does not know shrink. Mm -hmm. And you'd still have to figure out that scale is the word that you want. Right? That's right. The dictate reference is resolved. Yes. That's about it. That's correct. And I'll show you what we're trying to do with the, with the uh, vocabulary problem next. But yes, so to address the vocabulary problem, we really le need like a natural language uh, system that takes your vocabulary and translates it to the vocabulary of the application. Um, for some, what's interesting is that for some popular things like selection, Google will already do this because there are documents out there that say, oh, if you want to do selection in Photoshop, here are the 10 tools you might consider. But for more obscure things, like the 3D tools, you really need um, 
something else to do this mapping between the user's language and the application's language. Can you just see, like, there's, like, one lonely post on Yahoo Answers that says, I want to shrink something, and someone says, oh, you mean scale. Right. And that's enough that's to right. model your way through. That's right. So you could, I mean, the, for sure, using, like, a forum or discussion board is one way to alleviate that. Although you could um, imagine a system that mines that type of data and tries to make recommendations. So one of our other questions was, what types of content are more useful? So here, remember, videos um, are very popular. They're very easy to make, but they can be hard to use for instructional content, mostly because they're never at the same pace as, your, um, as the person who is using the software. And also, they're hard to scan. Um, and you know, not all videos are, are useful. Um, so what was surprising to, you, to us was actually that the choice of text and images over video had nothing to do with the instructional quality of those materials. It was entirely a personal preference. Some people went directly to YouTube and only looked for videos. And other people avoided videos like the plague. They felt like, oh, I don't know about the quality of videos, and oh, I'm in a meeting, and oh, if a video started playing, that would be horribly embarrassing. So um, this was, you know, despite, you know, from a research perspective, we were really interested in the instructional quality and how that influenced success rates. But no, they, they were much more interested in, like, the, the format itself. Um, and then, so finally, once people find examples, let's assume they can get through this vocabulary problem and find relevant examples, are they able to use those examples in their, um, it, for their, to solve their task? Uh, and here we found these two different strategies. One is the slow and steady strategy, and one is the fast and frantic strategy. So the slow and steady user will, t will take a document or a video and watch it very carefully and be very slow and uh, methodical and trying to understand what's happening. The fast and frantic person is just scanning, scrolling, and trying to see, OK, is this the right thing? And where can I find the right piece of thing to help me solve my problem? Um, and you know, neither of these strategies was actually better than the other. They all had the same kind of problem, which is that if the tutorial didn't fit the context of the user, it was often hard to translate it. And so what does it mean to not fit the context? Well, first off, it could be that the objects that you're manipulating are different enough that you can't actually just blindly follow what the tutorial is telling you. So here, you have an image being applied to a can that's not the same thing as putting text on a can. So uh, you, know, you would have to make modifications to this particular example to make it work. So that's one problem. The other problem was that the state of the application changes as you do um, the tutorial. And so if your state doesn't match the state of the tutorial, then you might see different menus and different things might be enabled. And so users were often very confused when the thing that, that the tutorial would tell them to do was actually not available to them in their own applications. And so we really need better ways to be able to synchronize what's happening in the tutorial with what's happening in the context of the application. So at the highest level, the findings from this, this um, study were, first off, there's really a problem around missing vocabulary. And second, users have a hard time generalizing from example techniques. So to try to address these challenges, we've been developing a number of different uh, projects. And the first one I'll talk about is a natural language interface, which really tries to get at this um, vocabulary problem. Then we'll look at how we might synchronize tutorials and applications. And then finally, we've been looking at games and whether we can use games um, as a mechanism to um, help the users overcome an overwhelming interface. So. Um, when we started looking at um, editing with natural language, we thought that natural language would give us two benefits. One of them is circumventing the, the, the pro application language. And the other one was we felt that you could use um, language to, to be more efficient. So you could imagine saying something to the computer that would take multiple steps. So um, the example I'll show you says something like, make the shadows on the left slightly brighter. So that's one. Sentence, um, you know, it takes a second for me to say it, and it results in a multi-step workflow. And so we built a system to explore these ideas. And 
here we go. And here's a video showing that system. This is a collaboration with folks at the University of Michigan. Um, Everyone takes pictures, but photo editing can be hard. You have to learn how to adjust colors, select objects, and improve the lighting. We have created a system that lets you talk to your computer and tell it what you want to do with your images. If you wanted to improve a sunset, you could say, darken the midtones at the top, so that the effect is only applied to that area and tonal range. A slider allows you to adjust the results. Now the ocean is too washed out, so increase the contrast at the bottom. That's better. You can also use touch gestures to describe where to edit. Blur in this direction. You can even use words that aren't specific to photo editing. For example, make it heavenly. Now let's do some work on this picture of my friends Sarah and John. One thing you can do is teach the system about what's in the picture. This is a shirt. And with face detection, it's easy to indicate who is here. This is Sarah. This is John. Now you can refer to those things as you make edits. For instance, change the color of the shirt. Now Sarah's face looks a little too flushed. Decrease the saturation on Sarah. Both of them look a little dark. Brighten Sarah and John. There we go. A few gesture marks and crop to here. To finish, you can apply popular effect filters. Make it retro. So in that, in, in these examples, you notice that there's both, so we explored support both for novices, so make it heavenly or make it retro, as well as for experts who have better understanding of that language, like knowing things about contrast or brightness. So um, how does pixel tone work? Well, at the highest level, we take gesture commands, speech commands, and we combine those and turn them into image editing operations. So what does that mean? Well, we take the speech, we turn it into text, we map that text to um, image operations, and we combine it with spatial operations that may be coming either from the gesture <coughs> input or from the speech itself. So let's take a look at a specific example, just to make this um, a little more concrete. So here we have the example, make the shadows on the left side slightly brighter, or slightly bright in this case. So we take the speech and we convert it to text. To do this, we have a two-part system. First, we have a recognition module that runs directly on the device that's tuned with a finite vocabulary that's specific to the image editing domain. So that's something that's quite fast um, and can turn that speech into text quickly. But, of course, if the user uses words that aren't in our vocabulary, then we need some way to turn that into text. And so for that, we go to a general purpose cloud service that gives us um, text in, in return for the speech. After we get the text, we actually have to now figure out how to map that text to the image operations and figure out which part of the phrase has um, the image operation and which parts have the parameters. So to do that, we first parse the phrase into parts of speech. So in this case, make is the verb expression, the noun expression is shadows on the left side, and the adjective is slightly bright. And once we have this parse, we compare it to a set of templates. And it's really the templates that tell us where the image operations are and where the parameters are. So here, bright is actually what corresponds to the image operation, and that fits under the adjective. Um, the nouns tell us where to apply this operation. So in this case, the shadows on the left side. And the adverb slightly tells us parameter value. So how much should we adjust that brightness? Um, 
of course, we might see words that we don't know, right? Our, our um, model only understands a certain set of image operations, or at least for the moment. If you say one we don't know, then we have to map it to something we do understand. And we to do that, we use synonym matching. So in the case of energetic, we try and see, do any of the things we know how to do closely relate to energetic? In this case, vibrant is similar to energetic. And so and the system applies the vibrance filter. Sorry, where are you getting that mapping? And we're using WordNet to do the synonym mapping. Okay. Yeah. And then finally, um, we execute the operation. And because uh, we expect that the user would want to manipulate that um, parameters, we give the user a slider to, to control that brightness. So we don't have to, they don't have to use speech to do that. Part of the key to this, we believe, is to have a multimodal interface. We're using speech and touch in concert. Of course, the system fails sometimes. And when it can't understand what you want, it actually just gives you a gallery of options that you can apply to your image. So we showed the system to a number of users. We actually had them do a comparison of, of the app you saw, one with a speech interface and one without. And um, almost everybody preferred using speech. And um, so this is encouraging, and I think one of the things that we found um, was that people off already had biases about speech interfaces and how poorly or uh, well they operate. And so there was already some amount of hesitancy. Um, one user in particular felt that, um, you know, initially I had doubts about the speech interface because my experience tells me that speech doesn't really work in other apps. But this one, it worked well. I think it's better than Siri. Um, you know, I think for this user, it really depends on what they tried to do with Siri. And, you know, this is very domain specific. And so perhaps that's why it operates better. Um, user 6 says, it's possible that my parents and grandparents could use this. We haven't tried it with, you know, a, a lot of different age groups, but it's certainly very, very encouraging. Um, so in the end, I think editing with natural language it is really, um, has lots of potential. And it really is, again, about these two things. Users can use their own language and can really um, avoid having to learn these very complicated image editing um, techniques and tools. And for these advanced users, um, there's really this opportunity to, to do this two things more quickly. Um, and we're right now really excited about this multi multimodal editing and trying to see how we can take what we learned on the iPad and translate it back into the Photoshop world in the desktop. Yes, sorry, so, Tim. I. Uh, so I'm curious whether the people who did not use the speech interface mm -hmm. used a different uh, sort of query. Did they use different vocabulary? Because when I'm using, say, the Google search app, mm -hmm. then if I'm speaking to it, I speak differently than if I'm typing to it. Mm. So, sorry, I should have made this more clear. So the people who didn't get the speech interface, they were not able to query with natural language at all. So they, they were just given a normal photo editing style interface which has menus and um, it had a gallery. Actually, the fallback gallery that you saw is what they were given. So they could still use the touch gestures and select, um, but they could not actually give it natural language. But I agree with you, you know, searching with, with keywords is different than talking. Well, yeah, I, I think to change the modality to speech, then people think it's more natural, which is, again, the problem with Siri, that we ask it too many natural questions, right? right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, especially if you're trying to edit with natural language, maybe taking speech instead of type to query, right. and it seems like a very clever decision. So, mm -hmm. out. Yeah, so the, I think in the tablet world, it's kind of an awkward thing to be typing and, and using gestures at the same time. I think in a desktop world, where people are not as open to talking because they may be in an office environment, um, I think that would be a really interesting thing to try and it's something that we're, we're looking forward to trying. Um, and, and, you know, I haven't seen anything that compares spoken queries versus typed queries. If you're familiar with, with work, I'd love to see it because, you know, it'd be interesting to know if, if it's just a subset, and if it's just a subset, then how do you pick out that subset um, from the natural language to make it more, more keyword-like, if you may? Um, <clears throat> any other questions? 
I'm going to move on to the next part of the talk. Okay. So, um, so in the next part, I'll tell you a bit about how we've been looking at synchronizing tutorials and applications. And um, in particular, I'll tell you about um, a project called Tutorial Player, which is a, an app that um, several of us in the lab uh, built and deployed. Um, and so I'll play this video and I'll just talk over it. So Tutorial Player is an iPad app um, here on the right. Um, and it's a tutorial application that any of you could actually download off the App Store today. Um, what's special about it is that it talks to Photoshop over the network. So here you see a screen, screen capture of your desktop. That's the iPad. Um, and so you can connect your iPad to Photoshop. And what that means is that every step in this tutorial that you view in this application is now interactive. So every step in that tutorial has a show me button and you can press that show me button, and that step is then ex executed in your application. Um, and the idea here is really to let people walk through these workflows and tutorials and see how um, the steps actually happen. Um, this, you know, the, the app does interact with Photoshop and lets you, um, and, and listens to what's happening. So if the user doesn't want to just press those buttons, but actually wants to follow the instructions, which we think is really the right thing to do if you want to learn it, um, they can go through and, and do those steps, and the tutorial player will respond to the user and actually scroll the tutorial for them automatically. Um, and the idea here is to really try and stay in sync so that the user can more easily follow what's happening. Um, and this works not just with the sample images that are part of each tutorial, but the user can, of course, use their own images, and the tutorial will respond in the exact same way. And so at this point, you're probably thinking, well, Mira, this is really cool, but what if you're, um, how do you create these tutorials? Um, presumably, your library is not the entire web, which is full of all kinds of interesting tutorials. And, oops. <clears throat> and so to create these types of interactive tutorials, we've created um, a plugin called Tutorial Builder. Um, and Tutorial Builder is there. It just has two buttons. It's very simple. Um, what it does is it takes a demonstration of the technique that you want to do in Photoshop, and it automatically turns it into a step-by-step -step tutorial. So <clears throat> all you have to do is just show, show Photoshop or show Tutorial Builder what it is that you want the tutorial to do, and it will just create the text and the steps for you. Now, the way that happens um, is inspired by the way book tutorials are written. So when we started this work, we went to, um, to, to the, the really high quality tutorials and we said, okay, how are these tutorials, why are these tutorials so effective? Well, they're effective because, first of all, they're you know, very specific in their steps. They're precise and succinct. They also give you a great overview, but allow you to focus on the details. And so um, we started with you know, our macro recording, which is what Photoshop gives us when you do one of these performances. And to translate that into text, we do a number of steps. First, we remove any steps that the user didn't actually do anything with. So if they selected a tool and then select another tool, we remove that tool that they didn't use. Second, we take any parameter adjusting. So maybe you adjusted just the, you know, the brightness parameter a little bit, and then you went back and adjusted it again. Well, you don't want steps that show show exactly that. We um, collapse those together and turn them into one step. And then finally, we create the text by using templates. Um, so here is what a template might look like. Use the blank tool to select the blank. And so that becomes use the, use the ellipse select tool to select the iris. Does anything look interesting here, suspicious? One. Yeah, anyone find anything interesting about this sentence? How did you find the iris? Good question. So, um, so it, it's part of the system. We run um, detectors on the image to try and guess what the user selected. Because if we can know what the user selected, then we can make the text more general purpose, right? So that if you wanted to apply this to another image, uh, you would want the tutorial, if someone had written that tutorial, you'd, you'd want it to say select the eye or select the mouth, not select the region as shown on the right. Um, <clears throat> when possible, we also capture images 
and annotate those images to help the user um, translate those instructions. And then finally, we lay out the tutorial. Originally, when we started, we, we modeled the book tutorials that we uh, were inspired by. As you saw in Tutorial Player, the, the layout now is, is much more web-focused. Web um, in follow-on work, we've been really uh, interested in walking this boundary between video tutorials and text and image tutorials. And so we've created what we call mixed media tutorials. Um, and what we did was essentially take Tutorial Builder, as you just saw it, which is essentially letting you do a demonstration, and we paired it with the screencast of the exact same demonstration. And we automatically segment that screencast and embed those pieces of the screencast that correspond to each step right alongside the step. And so what does that look like? Um, so here is the removing objects with the pen tool. If you scroll through this tutorial, you see that it looks just like um, a static tutorial with, with images. But in fact, each one of these is a video. And so you see the user's mouse here. Um, and, and this is actually a cropped version of the screenshot of the original screencast. Um, you can see the entire screencast oops, in the normal view. So this is what we actually captured. Um, you can also look at a zoom view if you prefer to just you know, look at the parts of the interface that are currently being used. Or you can look at them in the crop mode, which is removing everything extraneous. And we generate this um, fully automatically. So um, the other thing we've been doing is thinking about how can we take videos and make them more usable. Um, and so here I'll show you the pause and play system. And this system um, takes existing videos that you could find on the web and then tries to segment them to make them um, adaptive to the user. So on the left, you see the user using um, Google SketchUp. On the right is the actual tutorial video. Um, and what happens is as the user is using SketchUp, the video player is automatically pausing and playing to try to stay in sync with what the user is doing. So here, um, you know, there's the first step, which is to draw a rectangle and then um, extrude, I think, that rectangle. And so when the um, tutorial gets to a different tool, it will pause and it will tell the user, go activate this tool. And when the user selects that tool, the video automatically starts playing. So the user doesn't have to keep switching back and forth between the video and the application. The application is just playing. They can just listen to it or they can look at it and they can continue operating in their application at the same time. And in contrast with Tutorial Builder, where we had to actually create an authoring tool to make this um, richer kind of tutorial, here we're doing everything after the fact. So we take the tutorial video, we use computer vision to parse it, to figure out which tools are being used, and then we segment it. Um, and then the video player itself is listening to um, what's happening in the application and automatically pausing and playing, playing that video. Um, I think the one thing I wanted to mention is that the, the disadvantage of this approach is that we can't do the show me buttons. So we can't actually do the operations for the user because we don't have the command. Um, we can't extract that just from the video. Okay. Yes? So often I screw up even when I'm trying to follow the tutorial. Mm -hmm. And it seems like there's a, an entire sort of open area or challenge here of what happens when a user gets off the rails right. um, and they start thrashing. For example, if they accidentally click the button that the thing's expecting them to click, but they're actually a few steps out of sync and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if, right. if there's an opportunity to take this notion of sort of opportunistic learning to say, to realize that I got you know, this far right. and then like just focus me here because otherwise right. like, you're going to start rolling off without me. Right. Um, yes, so we haven't, so in both in Tutorial Player and in Pause and Play, we don't do any, any long-term comparison. We're very much just comparing kind of where you are right now and what you're doing next. Um, I think it would be really hard to do something fully automatic just because the user can really go off the rails 
unintentionally or intentionally, right? Maybe you decide, oh, this is really interesting and I want to explore this further. I'm just going to like take a break from the tutorial. Um, so, um, well, here's another way to think of it. I wonder, and this is just me wondering, right. I don't know, uh, if you were to look at sort of over the time of a, a tutorial, mm -hmm. how, and then like the y-axis is how important is it that you act, that the person actually see that information? Right. Is it like uniform? Do I actually need to follow step by step, as you pointed out? Sure. Or is it actually the case that most people actually just need this, this little tiny like bit and they tend to fast forward through, through right. the preliminaries? Um, yes, so I think the idea of doing hierarchical tutorials is really interesting and I think that's particularly useful for different expertise levels. So, you know, a true beginner might need really low level like step by step by step instruction while uh, someone that's more advanced might just need, oh, remove the background. And they don't have to follow your particular way of removing the background because they know how to remove the background, right? So, um, I think doing matching at that level is probably hard, but I think you may don't even need to do the matching, right? You could imagine having a tutorial that like expands and contracts uh, as the user needs that detail. Um, I think what would be cool actually is if if the user starts to follow a step. So so we've done some work actually looking at the content itself and trying to adapt macros based on content. And so I think that's another interesting direction. So you're using this example tutorial but it's not quite right for your tutorial or for your image. How do we adapt that workflow fully automatically so that it does fit? And so we've done work there on adapting parameter values, uh, which is doable um, when you, you know, we basically match up uh, image features with different parameters. And we know that like for daytime images, you want to pick these parameter values. And for nighttime images, you're going to pick these other ones. But we haven't done it at the workflow level. But that would be an interesting, an interesting thing to try. Yes. So, uh, sort of along a similar line. Um, I, I'm sort of curious how it relates to uh, living more broadly, or just not more broadly, but like at a different level of not just oh, I can follow these steps, but I, sure. I get what's going on. Right. So, for instance, uh, we've got the HCI class this quarter. Mm -hmm. We're putting people through things which are awfully like tutorials mm -hmm. and about halfway through the quarter we switch to giving them less on the rails mm -hmm. suggestions for what to do with the intention of this will help them actually learn right. what's going on better. Sure. Uh, I'm curious if you've thought about that yeah, uh, so dimension. Yes. So and I'll in fact, you know, this is perfect segue because in some of the game stuff we've done we're we're looking at exactly this. And you can have tutorials which are very prescriptive, do this, do this, do this, or you can have much more open-ended tasks which are, you know, this is your this is your task, try to find your own way through the application. And um, and I think there are trade-offs um, in both approaches. So let me show you what we've done with the games. Um, I think, you know, at the highest level, novices have a hard time with the more open-ended stuff. Um, but the more open-ended stuff tends to stick with them longer. So if you can actually, I think that's what the psychology, educational psychology literature shows, that if you can actually figure out your own way through the task, then you will remember it much more so than if you just follow a, a tutorial. So, so our, our, uh, our, um, <laughs> our idea for trying to do the more, um, uh, self-guided approach in the context of learning when it comes to games was, was in, came in the form of Jigsaw. And I'll just start playing this video. Um, but the idea of Jigsaw was to not use tutorials. It was to try and give you a task that you could do in the software that would force you to learn a specific tool. So the most basic puzzle we created, and we used the idea of Jigsaw puzzles. So the most basic puzzle we created uh, was one that teaches you about layers. So here, each puzzle piece is actually just sitting on a different layer. And all you have to do is select the right layer and then move the puzzle piece in the right spot. And after you do this, you ask the system to check your work. And it gives you points and tells you if you're finished. And, you know, um, So 
um, this worked really well for very simple um, for this very simple task. The thing we we found that was cool is that you could actually apply this for more complicated tools too. So um, this is the selection um, selection tool puzzle. So here all the puzzle pieces are now sitting on the same layer and they have a background and so now you have to figure out which selection tool you want to use to cut those puzzle pieces out and again place them in the in the um, in the right blocks. You can keep going with this. So we also tried this with adjustment layers where you have to adjust some of the puzzle pieces. And we tell you which adjustment layer to use. And here it's really more about exploring the different parameter values and learning um, how they influence you know, adjusting the image. And so this is a more exploratory approach to learning. And uh, we did do some evaluation. Um, and we found that for those people who had some background, it was effective, but for those who didn't, it was quite quite challenging. Because telling people, oh, go look at this, go use this tool, is not always sufficient. You need help often if you can't find it. So you really need to do scaffolding. Um, so the, the other game that I was going to show you is called Level Up for Photoshop, and it's one that we've been studying for much longer than Jigsaw. Um, and this one is back to this idea of using these more... Um, prescriptive tutorials. Um, and so here is how Level Up works. Much like Tutorial Player, it has interactive tutorials. They're presented as missions, and every mission has points. And so as the user completes the different steps, um, they get points. So here, this mission is to make the image sharper. And so the user is going to use the Smart Sharpen filter to, um, to make it sharper. And so I'll go ahead and fast forward. So when, they're, when they are finished, they get points. Um, and then they're also able to do quizzes. And when they finish with the quizzes, there's also badges. And of course, they can share them and, um, and get their friends to play too. Um, one of the things we added um, is more open-ended, which is around this idea of challenge rounds. And, and here, what we did is we said, well, we'll let people learn skills with the missions, and then we'll let them test those skills in challenge rounds. And to make this even more interesting, we're going to make these challenge rounds actually real-world tasks. So these are images that were submitted to us from nonprofits, um, and they you know, want these much better looking images. And so our question was, can we, A, um, you know, motivate these players to do better by giving them real-world context? And B, could this be a crowdsourcing platform for people like the Wildlife Center for Silicon Valley um, to get better-looking images? And so here, the user could, for any of these challenge images, the user could follow suggestions, or in addition, they could do their own improvements. So here, doing cropping, and then they could upload it to our servers to be sent back to those organizations. And so we've been setting level up for two years now. Uh, we've done a bunch of, a few different deployments. Um, the first one we, we did was really looking at the tutorials themselves, and then the subsequent ones We've been really interested in the crowdsourcing aspect and seeing how we can combine learning and crowdsourcing together to improve both. Um, and we've, the way uh, we've been doing the analysis for this has been through logs, through interviews, and, and surveys. Um, so in our first, our first deployment started a, um, in September of 2011, and it lasted for a year. And we had about um, 5,000, over 5,000 active players. Um, and you would think that you know, even when you have three levels, which is not a lot, it's four missions, three levels, you think everyone would complete it. But no, they don't. Uh, only about 35% of people complete um, this. And, and keep in mind that these are people who are going there all on their own. To even get to the point of actually installing Level Up takes quite a bit of effort. Um, and so if they got to the point of playing, they were very motivated. So it was actually surprising to us that they didn't then that not everyone completed the game. Um, but, you know, we had some specific questions in mind. In particular, what was, was the tutorial format effective? Um, and one of the things that people pointed out was that by embedding these tutorials inside the app, essentially pulling them off the web and embedding them, 
it became easier for them because they didn't have to go out and search for them. They knew that they were always there. Also, because they came from Adobe, they were vetted. They were better somehow because they knew who they were coming from. One user said, it got me to try things and gave enough instruction that I was able to rapidly make progress. Usually I get lost trying to find the item I'm looking for. So this really speaks to the, the idea that you can use this approach to really focus the user and stop them from getting overwhelmed by the interface. And I think that's the value in these interactive experiences that try to really focus you on, click on this, do this, don't worry about the rest. One thing that was surprising to us is that people reported playing for points. So, you know, going out to like just try it out because it's a game, but then using the panel as a reference down the road. So two weeks later, you remember, oh, I have this task. I remember I did this with the game, but I don't remember all the details. Let me open it up and actually use it as an interactive, tu as an interactive tutorial rather than just something that I'm playing to get points. And that's a side benefit of this tutorial format that we really didn't anticipate. I mean, I felt that, you know, these tutorials are maybe too boring. I mean, they're just step by step by step, right? I, I really thought that the jigsaw format would be more interesting because you would be pushed to really explore on your own. Um, one key question, of course, with these things is, did people actually learn anything new? Um, and we looked at actual application logs to try and get at that. And yes, indeed, everybody who played tried a new tool that they had not used previously in their, um, you know, in the logs that we have for them. And 83% of those people continued using those new tools after exposure to Level Up. One thing that was really exciting is that, you know, when we developed Level Up, it was really designed for novices. A lot of these um, missions are very basic photo editing things, you know, sharpen this, remove red eye, remove wrinkles. Um, but what we, um, but what we found is when we talked to more advanced users, they said, wow, you know, I never knew this feature existed. I've been doing this same thing. In this case, you know, this, this user was talking about straightening a photo. I've been straightening a photo in this other way, and I just found out about the ruler tool, and it's amazing. You're going to save me hours of, of time. And so um, that was really great. It, it meant that, you know, this, this had benefit for not just the beginners, but also for the advanced users. So it really serves as a vehicle for discovery, uh, which an application like Photoshop has a big problem with because it has so many tools. Even though there are new features coming out all the time, um, you know, the, the product team can't necessarily measure impact of those new features if people aren't using them. Um, so one user said, a lot of it is just accidental discovery. I blame myself because I haven't been as diligent about, react, about reaching out and finding the resources. This is why I enjoyed the game. It was fun and the exercises were brief enough not to cause one to become frustrated. They introduced me to features and functions that I never knew existed. Um, so in our second deployment, we really were excited about looking at the crowdsourcing piece and combining crowdsourcing and learning together to see how they could benefit each other. And so we collected um, images from two nonprofits, from the Wildlife Center for Silicon Valley, Design for America, which is a student organization. Um, I donated my personal photos. It was real <laughs> hardship on me. And, uh, and then we got photos from Adobe as well. And so we were really interested to see um, how people would react to these. And, um, and not only that, but given that, you know, this is a tool that was made for novices, would they do a good enough job of editing these images? So um, we did a four-month deployment. It started in September 2012. We had 3,500 active players, and over that time, they submitted over 8,000 images. The majority were novices uh, with some intermediate and expert users. Um, each image that was, um, that was part of the data set was um, improved by at least eight people, and we had 10 people who improved over 10, over 100 images. And this is what distri the distribution looks like. Um, this is submitted one image, so a third of our players submitted only one image, a quarter submitted two, um, and then another quarter submitted more than four or more. And so, I just want to give you a sense for what people actually did. Um, so here is um, here's one user who did a really good job 
um, an improvement. So I would say that there were many improvements that were actually quite quite nice, which was which is great. So um, this is not something that we taught them how to do in the um, in the game. We did teach them how to remove uh, you know unwanted objects, but you know we never asked them to remove leashes in particular. Um, here's another um, image that was edited that was definitely much better. Um, the, for example, the background here has been blurred and the woman is, is much brighter. A lot of people um, applied effects. So here um, you see that this car, you know, has this more, uh, is more stylistic, more stylized. Um, you know, whether this is an improvement or not is kind of a subjective metric depending on what the task is that you want to use this image for. Here's another filter. Um, this image of a cat is particularly challenging, I think, but this user managed to do a really good job. Um, here I'll show you a few submissions for this one particular image on the left. Um, they are just different, and I would argue all are better in, in slightly different ways. So here's another one, um, you know, and here's another one. Um, some people did very basic improvements, for example, straightening this image. Uh, and some people really took it in a whole other place um, and, you know, clearly showed that they had skills beyond what we were teaching them um, and really had a lot of fun, I would argue, <laughs> with, with the game. <laughs> um, and then some people tried to talk to us. Keep in mind that there was no way for them to text with us or to text with each other or communicate with each other. Um, but they found this game a little too easy. And then not everybody did a good job. I mean, so lots of people tried and, you know, I would argue didn't actually succeed. But they tried. Um, interestingly, we, so this person, you know, submitted this image but didn't really do, do anything useful. Um, we didn't, we looked for cheaters. We were curious to see if, um, like an other crowdsourcing platform like Mechanical Turk, if there would be cheaters. But we really didn't find any cheaters, mainly because there was nothing for them to gain by cheating, right? Like these are people who are learning. The only reason that they're using the software is for their own benefit. Um, so we looked at, we tried to more rigorously assess the quality of the images. You know, the, we selected a subset. Um, and we did three different um, assessments. We asked the requesters themselves if um, the nonprofit uh, requesters, um, what, you know, for the images that were submitted, which ones they would pick, whether it would be the original or the submitted. And it varied by, um, by organization. So um, 20 to 60 percent of those submitted images were considered better than the originals. We also did a mechanical Turk task where we asked Turkers, which image they would pick would be um, for a professional website. And there, uh, the Turkers found 37% of the submissions better than the originals. And then we also had experts rate um, the images. And the experts had a lot more information about the kinds of tasks that the um, players were asked. So they knew about the kinds of things they had learned in the levels, and they knew about um, the hints that they were given, you know, whether they should be adjusting brightness or straightening the image. Um, and so the experts found that 85% of the submissions were rated as same or better. Um, and that's because, again, they had a lot more context. Yes? Can I uh, ask about this 85 versus 37 percent? Yeah. It, it seems like uh, the experts are not judging quality of the output rather than they're judging the quality of the process. Okay. So it was really hard to try and figure out how to judge quality to begin with. Um, because there were two different things, right? There was, um, is this a, so there is the subjective, is this a better looking image? And that's a very subjective um, thing. Um, and then is this a, did they, did they complete what they were asked to do? And so that's really more about the process. And so the expert raters did a combination of quality and um, process. So if they, I think the experts, if the users, if the players did what they were asked to do and it looked better, you know, then they would consider it. We actually used the, a two-tiered rating system, usefulness and novelty. And usefulness was, is this better than the original based on what they were asked to do? And then the novelty was, 
did they use the tools that they learned in that level or did they use, you know, did they go beyond that? So, um, so yes, I guess to answer your, your question, yes, they were definitely looking at, pro at process um, in addition to quality. If, 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 if someone had to do this sort of study again, which of these three populations would you ask them uh, to test against? Would you? I would say the requesters. I mean, I think at the end of the day, like that's who's going to consume those images, so that's really all that matters. Because um, the Turkers, you know, uh, I mean, you're getting a general, there you're getting a general opinion of is this a good image or not. Uh, which, you know, they're not the ones that are going to use it at the end, so. I think what, what, um, what was exciting is that our novices did really well. So 78% of the novices submitted at least one image that was rated as better than original, which is, which is great. Um, so in the end, I think Level Up for Photoshop is an effective mechanism for teaching people new skills and for leading to discovery of these more efficient workflows. And I think it's an interesting point in the space of crowdsourcing platforms. It combines learning and crowdsourcing in a, in a new way. And most crowdsourcing platforms today don't um, consider how to embed learning as part of, um, as part of the crowdsourcing process. So I would like to conclude in, in saying that I think learning or, or using software has really changed in the last, let's say, 10 years. People are really learning opportunistically. And um, we really need to think about how to teach them um, so that they can be successful in these opportunistic um, endeavors. Um, so I have a number of ongoing projects, which um, I'll just mention quickly. Um, first, we're taking all the learning uh, work that we've been doing with with applications and we're thinking about how to use that in the real world. So uh, with collaborators at Berkeley, we're looking at how to make it easier, for example, to author um, videos, um, instructional videos for DIY tasks. And this is a system that tries to make it as easy, it tries to take frame, video frame editing out of the picture. So all you have to do is say, this is a step one, step two, step three, step four, and then the system will automatically segment that video and, and um, up, even apply effects to it and, and cut it ready for you to share. Um, we're, also, um, we're also looking at um, how to do workflow recommendations. So um, based on this idea, because we found that people are really not good at, at discovering new workflows on their own, we're trying to think about how we might um, mine what's happening in the application and suggest alternative workflows or alternative features to users. And then finally, um, I'm really interested in understanding user behavior uh, more generally. And so right now, we're lo working on building visualization tools to try to understand how people use applications, how they travel through websites. And um, to help, there's already a lot of analysts that are trying to understand this behavior um, in the digital marketing space. And so we're building tools to help them um, understand this type of behavior. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming and thank all these collaborators. This is not work that I've done by myself. It's a big team of people from a lot of different universities and Adobe. And so I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes? Challenges at all contribute to attrition? Like, like uh, compared to like after each individual lesson, like were the were the challenges did they lead to more people dropping out? No, the the rate of um, completion was pretty much the same with the challenge yeah. rounds. So they, I should say that they did not have to do the challenge rounds; they could skip through them. Oh, excuse They were not required. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Just on, on that. Uh, you didn't check if just the presence of the challenges caused more drop-offs. I'm thinking of as um, uh, Eric Anderson, who's working at SOAN, mm -hmm. up at University of Washington, had this study for uh, games for showing that the presence of things like extra coins that you could get but you didn't have to get caused uh, attrition in those games. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, we looked at completion rates for those levels, 
And there was no difference um, between having the challenges and not having the challenges. Um, and I don't know if it's because, you know, they're more than just like little gimmicky coins, right? They're different in flavor. They're an entirely different activity. And you have to commit to it, I guess. Like choose to do it or not. That's right. It's up to you if you want to do it. But, I mean, I guess that's not all that different than the coins. But it would be interesting to understand, like, why in that context those were detrimental and in our case it didn't seem to matter. Yes? So, uh, if, if, I, if I think of your talk in reverse, where you mm -hmm. start a word with tutorials first, sure. and then you say we can do natural language right. editing of images, I would think that if you have natural language editing of images, right. Why would you want to learn how to use Photoshop, right? If I can get my pictures to look good without mm -hmm. having to learn it, why would I learn it, right? Well, and I, I think it, it sort of comes down to whether you're teaching people skills that are more generalizable right. or whether this is something that's specific to a particular application which will be outdated in the next five years when you release a new version. Right? Mm -hmm. So where, where do you see, you know, the natural language part of it and the tutorial part of it, you know, working? So that's a great point. I think the natural language piece can couple quite nicely with the tutorial piece. Um, um, you know, I think the natural language uh, interface is essentially accessing a set of macros that you could predefine, right? You can think about these like preset workflows that you could access through the natural language, but those are never going to be complete and you're going to always have people who are going to want to go off and do their own things. So I think it's about the audience, right? Who is your audience? And I think there will be an audience that, that just cares about getting their thing done and they will just want the natural language. And that may be the larger audience. And then you'll have uh, an audience that wants to tinker and wants to, you know, learn the details. Yeah, I, I guess that's right. Uh, I also think that this, this first audience where, of the novices might be larger than simply novices because if you look at Stack Overflow, mm -hmm. I, I don't consider myself a bad programmer, right. but if I have to solve a problem, I'm not going to think through it. If there's a solution on Stack Overflow, I'm going to look right. it up first. It's just right. easier. So yeah, so mm -hmm. I think if, if you if you reduce the complexity of making some right. steps happen, mm -hmm. then you might find professionals also using yeah. say the natural right. language. That's true. Yeah, for at least subsets of their workflows. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yes. Following on that, it does seem like there's some optimal amount of difficulty because. If you took some of this project that could just automatically execute the tutorial, right? right? And it's like, I, I Googled for it, I hit go. Well, right. then I didn't actually learn anything. Right. Um, and, you know, so at some point, whereas if it's so hard to figure out, then right. no one's going to attempt right. that class, right. that mountain. Yeah. So I wonder if, well, A, if we have any theory that would basically guide us to how right. how much hand-holding we need, and maybe the education research can get us there. Right. Um, or maybe... Or maybe we don't use theory and we simply like do some like MC MC thing where we're just right. actually trying different approaches and right. sort of finding the optimal educational right. approach for this. Yeah, I mean, I think so. What hasn't been done, I think, is looking at workflows um, kind of in wholesale. Like you can't, for example, very easily if you could take a workflow and automatically throw your image at it, which actually we've done in in, in work that I didn't talk about today. Um, what hasn't been done is thinking about how you might, what are the, all the variations of a workflow? So today, when you, when you do any image editing workflow or any other really workflow, you're following a set of steps and you're you know, setting those parameters. And once you're down that road, you can't really go back and change those parameters, right? Like, that's it. And so having a, a way to actually modify those variables on the fly and seeing the whole workflow um, I, I guess exploring the space of a workflow um, could be really interesting. And that would be a very different skill um, that would only be possible if you have kind of a higher level interaction, whether it's with natural language or something else. Um, sorry, sure. Yeah. Uh, so that, that just reminded me of, uh, so these two workflows are really tools which have been composited together. And right. uh, I would think that there's some sort of a director graph of these tools. So you can pick a starting point and you can have multiple ending points for that. That's right. right. So I think one way that uh, as a student I might benefit from uh, these tutorials is to say, oh, and 
now that you've learned the step, you can also use it for these four other things, which are not really related to your current work, that's but right. you know, there's yep. other stuff you could be doing. That's right, and there is work that's, that's looking at that in particular. It's taking a repository of tutorials and aligning them so that you can have alternative workflows for pieces of those um, entire workflows, and then you could, of course, match along tools as well and say, how could I use this tool? What are all the different possible ways? Any other questions? Yes, there's uh, one so right behind I'm, me. I'm a professional designer, and I also teach uh, students about design and self-entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. and Photoshop itself is this very specific tool that, you know, as, as we all realize in today's audience, is, 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 uh, it has a large tool set. But I'm wondering if you looked at other models of learning that are outside of even Photoshop, outside of design, to inform this research. And if you did, what are the learnings from outside of that? I, mean, I guess, are you thinking of something in particular, like a specific well, domain? about how to teach students about design, but how can I apply this design teaching to areas outside of design as well? Mm -hmm. So you're asking me a very broad question. <laughs> so, so I'm not sure if I'll answer um, what, what you're asking. What are the, you know, if, if you looked at other learning models outside sure. of Photoshop. You mean educational approaches or other sure. platforms? Um, either. Um, so I've been very focused on, you know, design software in particular. Mm -hmm. I think um, I haven't, you know, look. The other thing we've looked at is creativity, which is, I think, um, different in that it's, it's, it's not tool specific. It's much more in the head than it is, you know, with the hands. And there is um, definitely, you know, a big difference between um, learning a craft, which is, you know, what you might call learning Photoshop versus learning how to design, right? How to be a good designer is as much about ideas. <laughs> it's as much about like being able to brainstorm and, and explore lots of ideas as it is about, um, you know, manipulating um, a tool, right? And so I think, I don't know whether what we've learned here would directly apply in the creativity space. Um, probably not. I mean, you know, I think to the I think for sure what we've learned here would apply to other kinds of crafts, like programming, for example. And programmers today extensively use the web, and they would have, in fact, a very hard time programming if the web was to disappear, right? So many people um, can't get on a plane and program because they may not have access to the internet. So I would say that what we've seen here would apply to other crafts. So, uh, I think we're seeing the same thing in the DIY space. So people go to YouTube for help all the time. But if you want help to become more creative, I don't know how you would do that, right? You would go and probably read books, and you would go and talk to people. It would be kind of a different type of, I think, learning environment. Uh, sure, go ahead. That's probably the continuing of the question. So probably creative people, users, they are looking for a network. Maybe communities, they are right. planning to mm -hmm. change their ideas. That's right. So maybe that's part of your research. You know, you, you know what is the most popular thing right. to you, so go to right. online community. So what is the most popular tool that people are using right now? Right. Yeah, so there's definitely um, opportunities around communities. Uh, and, and in fact, we've had various kind of projects in, in, in the past that look at what would a Photoshop with friends look like. And, in, and Level Up in particular is very single user, and we've always wanted to make it much more collaborative. And so I think um, there's lots to be done around collaboration and learning in particular. So yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, my major is instructional technology, and this Great. semester we have uh, our interesting project with Wikipedia Education. Okay. So Wikipedia they launch a new project called the uh, Wikipedia Education Program. So okay. basically, their target is the college level students and professors. Mm -hmm. So they encourage the professors to construct a course page on Wikipedia, mm -hmm. and for the whole semester, the mm -hmm. students. Uh, collaborate with each other to mm -hmm. edit the whole project or the topic the, okay. uh, the professor gave to them. Uh -huh. And for the professor, since they most of the time study the course for uh, many semesters, so for them they can enroll different students from each year to edit more. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting project, but 
since they just launched this this program, yeah. so they want to do a usability uh, testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I just feel the research you did with the Adobe program is very interesting. So I'm. Um, I want to know more detail, like how you design the evaluation or the analysis, sure. and I wonder whether I can find the research paper or some some more details about the research anywhere, or is that possible for you to share? Yeah. So a lot of the work that I've shown you today is already published. Um, the only thing that's kind of still coming out um, is the most recent level up in crowdsourcing work. Um, but I'm happy to share a draft of the paper. Um, so um, yeah, I mean you're you're definitely welcome to go to my website and and look at the papers and feel free to contact me if you have questions and I'll check out this education Wikipedia education website. I wasn't aware of it. Yeah. We'll take other questions offline. Um, I know you've got one, um, but we'll thank our speaker one more time. Thank you all.